So we're going to be talking about how to pass your CBAP, CCBA exam in 90 days. Um, that's the typical timeline a lot of people give themselves to pass this uh, exam. Uh, the CBAP, CCBA, or ECBA exams are held uh, with uh, the IIBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis. Uh, so we're going to be sharing you know, tips uh, that would help anyone who's preparing for the exam uh, to pass it at your first attempt. Um, of course, it's not the easiest exam. Of course, it's not. But is it? are we able to achieve that? Yes. Um, so I'm going to be uh, sharing this. Uh, some tips that I, I, I feel are would be relevant for people who are registered for the exams. And I'm going to also have someone who just, you know, took the CBAP exam. So it's pretty fresh. Um, she was able to, you know, achieve it in little or no time. And basically just to share her experience and, you know, um, tips that she used that helped her preparing for the exams and also on the exam day. And then I'm also going to share some things that I have put down that I feel would be helpful for everybody who was able to join this webinar. Um, being that I've taken the CVAP exam a long time ago, but the truth is the process is still the same, preparing for the exam and then on the exam day, how the exam runs through. So I'm going to introduce uh, Chioma Ogamba. Um, she's going to just uh, give us a brief um, advice on you know how she was able to prepare for her exams and then of course how she was able to t attack attack the exams on the day she took it i think Choma took her exams i think it was july yeah it was in july so Choma, if you're there i'll give you the stage now to introduce yourself and share um how you're able to you know get your CBAP certification like everything just share your experience. Thank you. Chama, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you for inviting me to this session. I'm going to try to share as much as I can uh, to help you, anyone listening right now, um, to help you guys prepare for your exams coming up. So um, I'm going to first of all mention, so Elma mentioned the timeline of 90 days, and that's a comfortable timeline, and it's okay to actually work within that timeline. Don't Make sure you don't put yourself under any pressure to do it earlier if you're not ready. Um, it's actually... I actually wish I had that time frame to finish everything, but I had other things that affected my own timeline and made me finish it um, in July, um, about one month after classes. But um, that's not really your ideal situation because you might you don't want to waste that money and not be really prepared when you take the exam. But if you think you can do it in one month or less than three months or two months or whatever, whatever works for you. Just make sure you know yourself and make sure you have time set aside for it because it's going to be uh, more hard work if you do it in lesser time, obviously. So uh, going into the exam itself, um, we all know the, B, the BABOC, the BA body of knowledge. And by now you should be very familiar with it in the sense that at least you must have started reading the first time or you finish reading the first time and about reading the second time or at least you know what it is and you've gone through it, or if not, at least the table of contents at the minimum. Uh, so I'm going to try to give some kind of guidelines and the steps I took and how you actually have to study and make sure that you're really prepared before the, you take the exam. I took mine in July, uh, on July 30th. Um, yeah. On July 30th, not to two weeks yet. So um, what I'm saying is something that I did. What, everything I'm going to share is based on how I studied, and I hope it helps you too. So first of all, um, you have to read the CBAP, at least, sorry, this, the BABOC for the CBAP exam at least two times. If you ask for my own personal advice, I'll say at least three times. Because 
by the third time, you're going to be very much familiar with what's on the textbook, what's in the bar book, and you're going to be able to figure out where any question you look at is coming from. So you can see a question and you can actually guess and probably be 100% accurate in guessing the knowledge area or chapter the question is coming from and that will help you make an informed decision on the answer to choose. So being able to go through the bar book from chapter one to chapter 11 and going through the glossary if you can I would really advise that because there are some terms, it might not be every single term in the glossary, there are some that are very basic, but if you can at least go through the glossary once, that's good. And then when you're going through it, you, see, you may see terms that you are not familiar with in the first place. So you can mark it for you to come back and look at it properly, or at least go to the chapter where it was mentioned and see the context and understand what that technique is all about. So for example, if it's a technique that you are not aware of, then, you have to be able, when you read the first time, the first time is more or less, you know, scanning through it, understanding um, what the babok is all about in the first place and seeing where you probably think, are, oh, this part I do it in my day-to-day -to -day job or this is entirely new to me and figuring out your strengths and weaknesses within the babok and so that you know where to focus on when you're coming back the second time to read it. And then when you're coming back the second time to read it, you are... What I did was I studied, uh, let's say, chapter four, a knowledge area. And then when I finished that chapter four knowledge area, I, I solved questions under that. So I did it pair knowledge area at first. And then you can, then you, then you can start solving those um, mock or simulation tests that have everything integrated. And so when you've done that for each knowledge area, every chapter of the book you've studied and then you try to solve questions, depending on the, on the question bank you have. If it's per knowledge area, you can do it that way. If it's not, then when you finish reading the second time, you can just solve you know, the, the consolidated question bank that has every knowledge area inside and get familiar with it. And then one key thing about solving questions and practicing is, um, when you're done solving and you want to review your answers, don't focus on only those ones that you failed. It's also good to focus on, um, uh, you know, looking at the ones that you got right, because chances are you have questions there that you probably guessed the answers and then you don't even know why you got them right. So if you don't go through everything, or at least focus more on the ones that you failed, but the ones that you got right, at least go through it, you know, kind of eyeball and check it and see if there's one that you failed. Look, I wasn't so sure, but I got it right. Why did I get it right? And then you learn it. So when you see it next time, you actually know the right answer to it. And, and you, because if you see it the second time and you didn't check it that first time, you got it right. Chances are you might guess wrong. I might actually fail it. So that said, um, another thing is when you're also going through your, your answers and trying to check the ones you got right and wrong, it's also good to also figure out, okay, I keep filling questions on the solution evaluation knowledge area, for example, and then maybe you want to go back to the Bible and study that chapter again and kind of understand it better before you come back again to solve it, right? So that's something that I think you should also try to do when you're solving questions and 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 reading then from the mock exam point of view you have accuracy and you have um, efficiency that you have to actually have a good grasp of before you take the exam when you're taking your mock exam you're not just solving to pass it you should be solving it under exam conditions and then you should also try to pass it of course but also check the time so for the CPAP exam it takes you're going to be given three hours 30 minutes for 120 questions so you have to work out the math of how on how long it's going to take you per question but then it's not a a clear it, it won't always work that way because some questions are case study questions and some are not case studies so some will take you longer some will take you shorter so when you're solving your, your mock exams, you have to be sure that you're trying to solve within that time frame. And the ideal situation is that you get to a point where 
if the exam, the mock exam is three hours, 30 minutes, like it is in the normal exam, it's probably taking you less than that to get your mock done and get your review done because you need that buffer. If you can solve the questions in three hours or two hours, 30 minutes or whatever it is, or whatever time you're saving, you need that buffer. You need to get to that point where you're not using the entire time because you really don't know what will happen on the exam day. Because my own exam day was a terrible experience. I, I felt sick that day. That was the day that I was, <laughs> I was made a state that I don't think I've ever been in that state throughout the time I was even studying for the exam in the first place. I, I, I was really below par. But what helped me was because I had that, um, that buffer of time, I started solving questions in less time because of, I, I did all my practice questions. So that's another thing. If you have question banks and you have practice questions, try to, and simulations as well, try to do everything before you take your exam so that you'll be very prepared. So whatever that happens the exam, the exam day, you know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't affect your results. So having that accuracy down and also your time being efficient when you're solving is very, very important. Then flagging questions. Um, it's good to flag questions. If you see questions you're not so sure of, try to take note of them. Uh, but I will, as, I will advise that there and then you might have an idea, okay, you can cancel out, let's say you have four options, you can cancel out A and D. So I don't know, for anyone that hasn't had that opportunity to solve questions yet, um, which I think you should by this time, but even if you haven't, you usually have um, buttons that you can click on and then you can cancel out a question. So you can say, I have four options. I know for sure it's not A or D, but I'm tied between B and C. So when you're tied between B and C, you might also be more inclined to C, for example. You can click on that, even though you're not sure and you want to come back and, and, and look at it later. You can click on that and then flag the question and come back later to look at it. Because if you run out of time, at least you would have picked something. But if you run out of time and you did not pick anything, then you, you automatically fail the question, right? So at least pick something and flag it before you come back to it. So that when you're coming back, maybe when you've gone through the whole exam and then you're now saying, oh, okay, now I'm seeing this question too again. I think I have an idea more of where it falls into. So you'll be able to um, kind of, how do I put it? You can actually have a better decision to make at that time because you might have seen other questions towards the end of the exam or in the middle of the exam or whatever that would have helped you to decide on, okay, I know what to answer for this question. It might not be C anymore, it might not be B, but at least you, know, you had something picked already. Then uh, um, rounding up here for quick case study questions. Case studies, the case study questions usually look intimidating at first, but they are not really. The case study, you have to understand how to, when you read the question, it might be four paragraphs, two paragraphs, or three paragraphs. You need to understand where they are coming from by the final cause. They'll give you, like, of course, a case. And then when you're looking at the end, you, they have a question. So when you read through the question, and then you're reading the uh, read, when you read through the case and then you're reading the question, you should be able to figure out which angle, what, where in the back book are they trying to set this question from. And sometimes some people would advise that you should read the question first before reading the, the case because then you have an idea what the question is. And then when you're reading the case, it kind of gives you an idea of what to look out for, whichever works for you really. And then one thing you also have to understand is because the case is really long, does not mean that the question is so difficult. It might be something that you may be able to figure out once you read it and then you read the question. It doesn't mean it's so difficult, but you need to read that case properly, right? And then by now you should probably know that the questions that they ask are all related to the babok. Like the answer or something that will lead you to the answer is in the babok. They don't set it from anywhere else. So even if you have case studies, Yes, you might not have the exact same case study in the bar book, but whatever it's asking you to figure out through the answers is in the bar book, right? And then um, one last thing before I tidy up this bit and then Eno can take over is um, I mentioned reading the bar book three times. So when you read the bar book the first, second time, and then you're reading, say, the third time when you're revising, you're, you're going to see things that you felt, no, it can't be in this, it can't be here. 
it wasn't here when I read it the first and second time. And that's because you become, you're becoming more familiar with the Babok and then you're seeing, you're not understanding better. You have a deeper understanding of, of what the Babok is saying, of how every knowledge area leads to the other and how they are linked together and how they work together. So, because sometimes it's not always, it's not necessarily linear. The knowledge areas are not necessarily linear, even though there's some kind of linear part of it, kind of, but it all depends on how you implement it. So you need to understand how it's all connected, how, we, what technique works better in which knowledge area. Studying those techniques, seeing, studying your inputs and outputs and all those kind of things. Someone asks me sometimes, do you need to um, memorize everything, every input, every output? I don't think you do. You need to understand what it is. If you understand what is going on there, why is this input going here and why is what's output? Even when they ask you those questions, you can figure out, you can be able to answer it because you understand. But if you memorize it, you might not be able to remember. What if you miss one, one bit of that memorization and then everything just goes to, you can't, you can't remember anymore. It just messes it up. So you need to understand what you're studying. And when you're doing your test, you need to make sure you're, you're hitting at least 90% and above. If you're not hitting 90%, at least 85, nothing less than 85%. But if you want to be really comfortable, at least 90 and above, if you solve questions and get less than that, go review and go back again later and solve them again. At least 90 and above for you to know you're really ready so that whatever comes up, you don't fall below par and you can actually um, pass. Um, when, you're, when, you, when you're done with your exam, they'll send you what your what you scored in each knowledge area whether it's highly comparable or is it comparable and then low and I, I i don't think you're even allowed to have a low maybe Enoch can touch more on that later or we can talk about it after this but at this point i think i've kind of exhausted the points i have during the course of the of the webinar if i think of something else i'll let you guys know but this was basically what i did throughout and and it did work for me but you have to be able to set out time at least every day or at least five times five days in a week to study even if it's one hour two hours whichever that works for you but you have to have a set time to study and try to study consistently over time so that you can build on the knowledge that you have and even if you don't book the exam right now maybe you book it when you think you're getting to the point where you're ready which is fine, but have that day in your mind. So if it's three months from now, you know you want to sort of take the exam three months from now, you have a date and you put it somewhere. So you know you're working towards something, you're working towards a goal that you want to achieve. So on that note, I think I'm done then, no? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly into preparing for your, your exam, um, how the exam works and what to do on that day. So, of course, after you've taken your training and you want to take the exam, you're ready to take your exam, the first thing I tell people is read the Babok the first time. The first time you're reading the Babok, you're basically just skimming through. And that's fine. If you're, if you're not familiar with any terms, don't bog your head about it. If you're not familiar with any terminologies or anything you're seeing, just read it. Skim through it like you're reading a novel. But make sure you read it from start to finish. Go through all the knowledge areas read the techniques, the underlying competences, don't skip any part. I saw someone ask someday if she should read underlying competences. Why not? There are questions asked around that. The techniques, yes, please read the techniques. Know your inputs, outputs, elements, tax. Now you read through the Bible the first time. It could be a scheme. You're not supposed to know everything at that time. Now what you should do is take, do a test. Do a test of yourself and then you're seeing, okay, I think I did, I got 30 or 40%. That's fine. At least you're even getting a little grasp of the Babok. Now go back and read the Babok again. Read it through the second time. And by the time you're reading it the second time, you're taking practice tests for each knowledge area. So let's say you do a recitation and collaboration. You take a test on a recitation and collaboration. You see where you failed. You go back and you read it again. You do the same for requirement analysis, design and definition, solution and evaluation. You go back and do the same. You've done that. You've read the Babok two times. 
when you've done that, do a mock simulation exam. When you've done a mock simulation exam, you probably won't get up to 80 or 90, but that's fine. Now, you, once you've done that, go back and read the Babok the third time. When you're reading the Babok the third time, you now find that you're understanding everything better. It makes more sense. It's now more like a jigsaw puzzle that you're putting everything together. And when you're done reading the Bible the third time and you go back again to do a simulation exam, you should be getting above 80, 90. I tell people, if you get anything below 80, you're not ready for the exam. Like, and that's something I told Chama when we were talking before. She went, if you don't get anything above 80, 85, in fact, right now, some simulation some simulation software make it so hard that you must get 85. If you don't get up to 85, it will tell you you failed. But the truth is, when you're that prepared, and I tell people this, when you're that prepared for the exam, when you get into the exam hall, and I kid you not, you find that you're more efficient, you're faster, you're answering questions, your brain is already sharp. In fact, you see questions on the exam day, and you immediately know the answer because you've done so much practice you don't even have to bug your head so much about like basic questions. Now, how does the exam work? It is 120 questions. It's three and a half hours. And then the case studies, which is the most tricky part of it, there are about six to 12 case studies. It depends. Some exams don't have that much. Some have a lot. And then some have a lot of, some, some will have a lot of diagrams and some don't. So it varies. But the case studies will always be there. And the case studies, is the most tricky part of the quest, the exam, very tricky. You can have a case study that's two pages and then you're, you have say 10 or 12 questions for one case study. Now with the case studies, once you miss it, once you don't understand, first of all, the first question you should ask is, what knowledge area am I in? First question. Second question, as a business analyst, what should I be doing in this knowledge area? So start thinking, what are the tasks, what are the elements in this knowledge area? Once you're able to get a grasp of what you're doing in that case study, you're able to answer the 10, 12 questions. Because once you miss what you're supposed to be doing in that case study, you're going to miss all the answers for 10, 12, 10, 12 questions. Hope I'm making sense. So for example, if you're in a case study where you've, they've combined a citation and collaboration with requirement analysis and design definition, and they give you a scenario and the BA has just um, elicited his, um, collected his elicitation answers. The next thing you should do is confirm it. So when you know what you're doing in every knowledge area, it helps you understand that, okay, I should do this next. After doing this, what should I do next? What does the bar box say? For every question you're seeing, ask yourself, what does the bar box say as regards this task, as regards this knowledge, knowledge area? There are so many trick questions in the exam. Please take note. If you see any option that you've never seen in the bar book, don't waste time to eliminate it. They would never give you any question outside the bar book. So if you see any question that has answers that are out of the bar book, you see any term that is outside the bar book, eliminate it first of all. So use elimination the method. That helps a lot in the exam because they also do something which I find very interesting and I really love it is that they mix, they mix the questions with PMP questions too. So if you're someone who has probably done PMP or you've read the PM book, there are some terms that uh, the BAP book would have in the, in the CBAP exam that would probably confuse you between BA and PM. So remember that you're a business analyst, not a project manager, so your tasks are different. And then, of course, the difficulty level is higher, you know, for ECBA, CCBA, and CBAP. CBAP is really the hardest. Uh, CBAP has those case studies. ECBA doesn't. Uh, CCBA, uh, just a few, but not as difficult. The difficulty level is not as high as the CBAP. So what our advice is, you know, I said, I said the class is 90 days. 90 days is like perfect timing for anybody who is ready to take the exam. People are taking it in one month, two months. You know, but my advice is to read every day. Even if you're not taking the exam in 90 days, try to read every day. Refresh your mind on, you know, the terms. You know, read the glossary. Some people, when I was taking my exam, I bought like audio books. I had flashcards that would just, I was just looking through terms. Because for me, I was, the version three, I find it's even a lot easier. In the version two, 
which we did years ago, was a lot more technical. I didn't really know all those technical terms that were being used. So I had to use a lot of flashcards. I did a lot of audio. So I just plug it in, you know, and I'm listening to it at work or as I'm going to work or whatever. And I was listening to, you know, audio. So you could do audio if that works for you, but try to always read every day, get some business analysis knowledge in. And then another thing you can do that would really help you, and this is what I did that really helped me fairly with the techniques was at work, start applying what you're reading in the bar book. You know, find a way to apply it. So even if it's just in maybe in using interviews, in the techniques in your meetings, you know, um, in your tax, your process analysis and all that at work, start trying to relate what you're reading in the bar book to your work. It will help you so well. I remember when I was preparing for my exams, I found a lot of the techniques kind of difficult. So I guess the things I hadn't started doing yet, like mind mapping, process, um, process diagram, and all those, all those things were just very, they were very new to me because I hadn't really done them. But what I started doing was I started mapping out the processes, my processes at work. And that just helped me understand process flows and all those, you know, class diagrams and all those things because diagramming was never, it was not anything I'd ever done. I was more of, I was more functional than technical, but I started actually applying those things to what I was doing at work, and it kind of helped me understand. So when I was reading, it, I say, oh, okay, so when I do this at work, okay, so that's the process. So, okay, I was just matching everything together. So that helped me really, really understand what I was doing. Something also very important I would like to say is, if you know you want to take the exams, and that helps me a lot, book your exam dates. No need to play around. Book your date, have a date fixed. If you're saying, okay, I'm going to use 90 days, I'm going to use 120 days to prepare for my exam, 30 days. Book your date and work backwards. If I book my exam date for December and we're in August, I know that, okay, I'm going to read the Bible by September, I'm done. When I'm done, I'm going to take practice questions, read it again in October and do a lot of mock questions, read it again in November. And by that time, I've done three simulation exams and I'm ready for my exam in December. So set a plan, have goals for your exam. That would really, really help you to work, um, you know, to work with your timelines. Like if you don't, for me, if I don't set a date, I don't find myself that serious, like actually waking up at night to read or, you know, staying back at work to read because I haven't really booked a date. Even, my, even in my uh, subconscious, I don't feel like there's something ahead of me I have to do. So very important, don't, don't ever underestimate the, the role that, you know, simulation tests and the question, practice questions play in preparing for your exam. Very, very important. And like I said, always try to play it into, you know, what you, what you do at work. And then something I like to say is the, ex, the questions are strictly lifted off the Babok, nowhere else, read the Babok. Or like some other exams you have to, probably take and read another study guide or whatever, read the bar book. The questions are taken right off the bar book. I've seen where they took questions right out of the preface and I'm like, wow, this is serious. Right, of the, right out of the introduction page. So do not underestimate any part. Even the perspective, underlying competences, the techniques, read the techniques, the advantage, disadvantage, elements of all the techniques. You need to, you need to read through them. You need to know them, you know. So, um, so these are the things that um, I find useful um, as regards the exam. I, I hope I haven't missed out anything, but so far that's really what I have to say as regards the exam. So I'm going to take questions now. If anybody has a question, let me know and you can ask. No one has questions. This is a golden opportunity to ask questions. Nobody has questions. If you have a question, you can type it or unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Olumide. Okay, Olumide, can, you can share your question. Hi. Um, so you, you we're talking about um, flashcards and audio, right? Uh, but where can we actually get, like, audios to um, actually purchase. What a macro alien has that. Okay. 
So besides the barbecue, um, you recommend watermark and any any other um, resource, or that that's just it, watermark and the barbecue. Um, so watermark has audio flashcards. They have like in the whole nine yards. They have simulations. They have practice questions. Um, mm -hmm. Adaptive adaptive have simulation and practice questions. But I they have watermark. They had audio. They had the audio which you can listen to. So if you're someone who you're very auditory, you like to hear what you what you want to read, right? You can try the audio. Yeah. So adaptive has. Yeah, adaptive has audio as audio as well. So okay. the thing about audio books is, I also use audio books and I also use flashcards. Flashcards help you with those techniques and those terms in the glossary I mentioned earlier, and they just help you to even know the ones that okay, you're not so comfortable with. With audio books, by the time you've read the bar book like two, three times, I you, I still went to listen to the. In fact, honestly, I think I went to that bar book. Technically, I think I went through it like seven or eight times, two different, two different ways. Because the audio books that Adaptive has, I think they have like per knowledge area. So if you do per knowledge area, or even if it's the whole bar book, or if it's the videos or something, you're going through the bar book again, just that you're not really necessarily reading the bar book itself, but you're still getting the knowledge. Or at least when they explain some things via audio or video, you might now, you might now say, oh, okay, that's, that's, how this okay now I, that, that makes sense now so it might not be when you're reading that those aha moments will come it might be during the audios or the video it just depends on what works for you so you can use different avenues to cover the bar book the, the content of the bar book apart from reading it three times so that actually helps you to to deepen your understanding of the bar book it really helps all right thank you very much you're welcome anyone else um, so, um, Shago Ajibade is here. Um, I know he joined us really late, but um, um, Shago is also one of um, those analysis mentors that, you know, we look up to. Um, he's a trainer and a senior business analyst. So I would really just love um, Shago to just share some tips as regards um, passing the CBAP exam, and then we'll take the next question. Okay. Hi, guys. Can everyone hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Hi. Okay. It's great to be here. And uh, I just want to use this medium to say um, for everyone that is actually looking at um, getting their CBAP certifications, um, you are on the right path. And, um, you know, a lot of speakers are, a lot of speakers here have said, shared their journeys and then giving us a lot of um, tips as to how we can go around it. I'm just going to add to that. And then if there are any questions, um, we, can, we can look for a way to answer that. So for me, one of the things I usually emphasize is over and beyond the theoretical knowledge, you know, for people who probably don't have relevant experience to be able to match what you're studying in Babok or whatever study guide or whatever, you know, whatever you use, videos, flashcards, you know, watermark learning, adaptive and all that stuff. That is what makes it stick because you're going to get practical questions right on the exam. So if you are trying to use theoretical knowledge, you may get confused sometimes. You know, being able to study is one thing. Being able to understand is another. And then being able to superimpose that on your experience. Nobody can take that away from you. For me, that is the greatest thing. And uh, we can't emphasize the fact that, yes, you need to study your bar book. You need to read. You need to understand. You need to understand underlying competencies, you know, how you're going to relate that to different questions. You need to understand different techniques that you're going to be using, you know, as a BA. So your industry knowledge as well is something that I want to say that it is also important. If you don't have industry knowledge in health insurance, for instance, there's no way and you have, you have that in maybe financial services. There's really no way you have to study the ropes. How does it work in this industry? If it's oil and gas, for instance, I don't have a lot of experience in oil and gas. So if I want to work for an oil and gas company, for instance, or I want to do BA for them, I need to be able to study the ropes, the processes, how do things work in that you know, in that industry. So to be able to pass the exam, 
just to reiterate again, you don't know the, where, where the questions might be coming from. Um, I, I'm not sure, I think I overheard, um, I'm not sure, Chairman, I think, you know, talking about another way to study. Let your frequency of exposure to the material, you know, you need to increase that as much as possible. If you are the type that you learn by listening, do the audio. If you are the type you learn by watching videos, you can do videos. If you are the type that you learn by reading and marking and you know all of that stuff, learn that way. But there's the, if I don't, if I even learn by talking, you can talk to someone about you know different questions or different areas. It begins to stick. So the more the frequency of your exposure to that material is, the better for you. You know, it might probably not be you know something that is so easy. You know, grab the Bible and then start reading. You will fall asleep, like we always joke about. So, you know, what am I saying in essence? We can't overemphasize the fact that we need to study Babok and we need to make sure we increase the frequency of exposure to the material. So, I think that will be all for me now. If I, I can take questions, if anyone has questions. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you, so uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shegun. Thank you so, so much. Um, so there's a question here. How many hours does one need to read consistently to be ready enough? <laughs> if, uh, and now this is your laughter. It varies for different people. <laughs> <laughs> it's it varies for you, you can see someone that might read for like 250 hours, someone else might read for 100 or 150. But I know I've seen different places where they, they suggest you read at least 100 or 150 hours. But Honestly, I think it's more or less when you know you're ready for an exam, you know you're ready for an exam. Um, exactly. If you have done everything that we that we said that you should do that you should do today, like read the babok two three times or listen to the audio or video, when you go over it over and over again, and you know it's making sense, and you're solving, and you're seeing you're so, you're getting eighty five like at yeah. least though at least, but you are if you're hitting ninety ninety something. And you're doing your simulation tests and you're seeing questions and you can just answer them like on the go on the, or the case study you're looking at it and you kind of figure out okay maybe they're coming from solution evaluation area you might not necessarily always get 100 you might not even get 100 at all but if you get to a point where you know you're solving and it makes sense to you and now you understand what babok is saying and now you think you can even apply for me i was already applying what i was learning at work even before i took the exam so when you actually get to that point of understanding i really know what it is that you're doing then it's then you know you're ready. No one will tell you you're ready. No one will even tell you you're not ready when you know you're ready. And and I, I at the point I just lost count. In, honestly, initially I was counting hours like okay twenty hours, but I just stopped because I actually know I I passed that hundred or hundred and fifty. It was more or less. I got to a point where I was like I need to know that I'm ready. I've really covered this enough times, and I can actually teach someone what it is I'm learning. Because when you get to that point, you know, okay, you really understand it. You might not necessarily have to teach before you do the exam, of course. I'm just saying, when you get to that level of understanding, I really understand it. You will know that you're ready. So I, don't, I really wouldn't want to say any particular number of hours to answer that question. But I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Choma. Thank you. Um, what Choma said is correct. Like, you can't, there's no particular number of hours. Everybody studies differently. You know, some people, you know, after work, you know, they, they stay back at work to study. You know, some people go back, go to work early and study, and then they use their Saturday, Sunday weekends, they are studying. Some people can read for 10 to 12 hours straight. Some people read, take breaks, three hours, four hours. So it really depends on you, you know. But like Thomas said, you know when you are ready. You know when you're ready. Something I just want to cover um, the exam day. If you can, if you have booked your exam or not, book your exam in the morning. It's not like going with a fresh brain yeah, early in the morning, 8 or 9 a.m. You get there and you get your exam done and you're done by afternoon. If you're booking your exam later in the afternoon where maybe you have to go to work and leave work to take your exam, I just feel like you're not very settled. So prepare for your exam day. Know your days, know your center. Go with you know, a means of identification. Arrive early. And of course, don't stress yourself on the morning of your exam or the day before. Just rest and relax before your exam day so that you're able to give it all your best. You know, you're, able, you're allowed to, you know, go, go to the washroom. Go to the washroom. Wow. You're allowed to go to the washroom, you know, during the exam and all that. So you're, you're supposed to do that. You can have, you drink water, whatever makes you feel comfortable. But just don't be so tense 
And as regards the questions, you can always you know, flag a question and answer it later. Some people say, oh, the, I answer the easier ones first and then the tougher ones I answer later, which is fine. You know, for a lot of case studies, maybe you may read through and it doesn't make sense to you. You can flag it and read, read it and do it after. You know, and most times I find most people I know, for me, myself, I was able to finish everything in two hours. And then my last hour was just revising all my questions, you know, reading through all my answers to make sure I answered everything correctly, to make sure I didn't skip anyone at all. So, um, Baba Jide, you have a question. Please go ahead. Okay, hi. Good evening. Hello, evening. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, from your own experience, what do you think is um, the pass mark for the exam? Because I know um, IIB have not... Um, Established um, a known pass mark. So, what do you think is the ideal pass mark? Um, you rightly said that most of those um, simulations exams have 85 and 90 percent pass mark. But I know the pass mark is not that high as the simulation. But from your own experience, what do you think is going to be the pass mark? Then I have a second question. I had on the exam day there's a paper whereby you could. Um, at the beginning, you could just write things, probably things you just want to jot down. Is that true? Eno, do you want to take that? Thank you. So um, I want to let Chioma take that because um, she just took the exam. So I want her to answer about the scribbling part. Um, I know you can scribble your question and you can ask for a... a and a sheet to write on, but I want to know how she took her exam since it was recent. I knew I was going to do this. Okay, so I, I want to really verify that question. Are you asking for, did he say scribble on the screen or something? No, no like, like a paper. Paper. Like paper. paper. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I can't, I didn't hear him so properly. Okay, yes, they give you sheets of paper to scribble things on. You can calculate if some minor financial ratio things come up. Um, mm. They give you a calculator as well. But you also have a calculator um, on the screen that you can use. So yeah, that's about the scribbling part. Then about I don't know if I'm also if I should also take the the pass mark thing. Um, I'll yeah, I'll ahead. take that. I'll take that. But the okay. truth is the truth is nobody knows. Like IIBN never revealed that to anybody. And then the way the exam is now is you know like you said you know very comparable comparable I think are low. I think that's how they are ranking all the different knowledge areas. They will never tell you. Yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of, you know, uh, grapevine that it's 70, it's 75. Nobody really knows. But the truth is just give it your best. Um, I don't know if uh, maybe, Shegu, you know the past mark, you know. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> you, you, you answered the red. Not, 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 not to make you feel like you put me on the spot. But you already answered it, really. I mean, IIB never discloses that, you know. It's almost like a percentile thing. But again, see, they have different um, sets of questions. So let's assume there are four of us and we're sitting the exam in one center time. We most likely will not be doing exactly this set of, do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for some, you will see that maybe you have more of this knowledge area or you have more of techniques, you know. In fact, sometimes when you read a question, you're probably not sure, okay, I read Babok back to back. What exactly is this question talking about? Is it talking about techniques or is it talking about this knowledge area? Is it talking about this part of the project or something? Sometimes, you, and if you, interpret, if you interpret it wrongly, you're most likely going to answer wrongly, you know. So just before I digress too much, talking about Mark. I want to believe it's almost similar to um, the way PMI actually does their own kind of um, scoring, you know, where you have, you know, different what you have now, knowledge um, process groups, you know, you have closing, initiation, monitoring and controlling and stuff like that. So they go, you're moderate here, you're low here, you're high here, that kind of, so like, Across board, you must be a do well. No one knows what smart possible, like German and or you are going through and you prepare for the exam and you are, you are doing your study packs and you see that like you are getting 90 and stuff like that. 
you know, you're kind of good to go. So, but overall, ID has not disclosed to anyone till date. That's that's the bit I know. I, I hope it kind of helps you, Baba Jade. <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's yeah. pretty much what we all know. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. Anyone Any other questions? questions? Hello. I just just not to beat a dead horse or anything, but but I really it's good to know like the past mark, like what you're working towards, but. Um, when, when taking tests generally, if the pass mark is 50%, you should be aiming to be getting 70 just so you have that buffer because you don't know what's going to come out in the exam. You don't know how that day is going to be for you. You have a lot of things can actually go wrong so that even if you fall low, fall, 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 you fall below that 50. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And that's why we, we are mentioning 85, 90 because then you're more comfortable to, and more confident to actually go into the exam hall because if you start, if your mind just captures that 70, 75 and let's say it was published or whatever, they say IIBA says that's what it is and you just capture that 70, 75 unconsciously you might just be saying ah if you just see 80 or 78 ah i've passed now I'm, I'm okay i'm ready but you're really not as ready as you should be because you want to get to a point where you have that really high score so that no matter how things happen or whatever happens and you just find yourself in a situation where you're not at par on the exam day and you've already paid if you leave that if you leave that exam hall that day even if you're sick or anything you're going to pay extra money to do it again. You're going to have to pay again to do it again. So if you get to that point, you want to know that, okay, I know I'm really prepared, so I have to give this my best shot. And so even if it's not your topmost performance, you will not get less than whatever pass mark that they have. So just aim for 85, 90. In fact, honestly, 90 and above. So that you, if you get to, if you don't say high 80s, 90 and above, so just so it look like it's, and it's not that, it's not that difficult. If you prepare over time, you see that it's not, it's achievable. It's not that hard. Yeah, it's very, very achievable. Very, very achievable. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is on the day of the exam, just don't be anxious. If you know you've prepared and you know how well you, you've worked hard for it, you, you'll definitely scale through you know just you know be relaxed if you see a question that you can't just think of the answer flag it you know you can always oh, you do it at the end start you know with the easy ones and then the case studies you can take your time read through them the case studies so tricky that a lot of people fail them you know so always read through read the case study read the questions read the case study again and then you ask, start asking yourself, okay, where are, what knowledge area is this? Where am I, you know, in the bubble right now as a business analyst, according to the bubble, what should I be doing, you know, at this point in time? You know, that would really, really help you. And don't forget to please go with a government issued ID. Very important because um, situations where people forget their IDs, government issued IDs at home, they can't identify, you can't write it. And then, you know, it kind of destabilizes you that morning of your exam. So, any more questions? We have some minutes to go. Any more questions? I don't have any questions, but I have a last comment to just okay. mention. So, I know you said something about, you know, the day before we relaxed and all that. I, I'm going to probably take that a, a step further and just suggest that that week of your exam, you should be, you know how when you're, up, you're climbing a mountain or let's say, I don't know, let's say it's a, it's a graph, for example, and you're beginning, you're just gaining momentum. And then towards the middle of your preparation or towards the second, um, the second third of your preparation or something, you're really at that high peak where you're studying more, doing more hours, and then you have to start slowing down. The week before your exam, you should actually be, more relaxed you shouldn't be doing so much reading and so that's why it's important to know yourself and know know like how long it's going to take you and set out set aside time and actually allocate tax those times and each day because the week of your exam you want to be doing more revision and you know listening to audiobooks and or doing something that is not so stressful and getting letting your mind and your brain rest but not rest to the point that you sleep you know but you know be calm and so, so that the day before your exam you're you're more at ease and you're going to take things easy because it makes, it helps you. It helps you to perform better on the exam day. It really does. Yeah. So, and, 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 of, and, and if, if for those that are not here, when I mentioned, please book morning, 
if you're well some people say i'm not a morning person but in the morning when you wake up you're more active and you can actually be more effective and efficient in the mornings as against in the afternoons so it's better for that's why that if you had actually started slowing down the week before the day before you should be sleeping early in fact from you should actually not sleeping too like depends on how your schedule is but at least that day before try to sleep as early as you can to get as much sleep so that the morning you wake you'll be able to your body is you know has gotten enough sleep and wakes up on its own or can easily wake up early enough to get there on time and then of course go uh, if possible pack your bag the day before or pack the things you need in an envelope the day before and um, if you're taking it here in calgary i know that the center i know that they they can take driver's license but they still send you a message to, to get your passport they didn't ask me, but it's good to have, you know, it's good to have both of them just so that when you get there, you can present anyone they ask you for. And you wouldn't be worried about whether you brought only the driver's license or whether you brought books and stuff like that. So being really prepared and organized and into the exam hall and everything, it will increase your performance indirectly. Thank you, Choma. Thank you so much. Um, Baba, did you have a question? I see your hand is up. Or is it the hand that was up before? Yeah. There's yes. the previous one. Okay, yeah. all right, okay. Um, something I'd like to say, uh, and this is for people who are non-tech. Uh, I, I was non-tech, you know, before I took my CBA, but I've been non-tech. I tell people this all the time. I say my background was in, you know, I was never a, a technical person. Same with Choma, same with, uh, you know, Shego. You know, you, if you've never been a technical person, my major struggle, and this is me being real with you guys, my major struggle with studying for the exam was the techniques. And major struggle was the techniques because I hadn't used a lot of the techniques. A lot of the terms were very strange to me. So first off, if you see a term that is strange to you and you've read through the babok and it still doesn't make any sense to you, research on it, Google it. Look for, look for other resources that can break it down and explain it further. That may, maybe you see more examples that will help you understand it. The techniques as well. If you see a technique that you've never seen, you've never used before, you know, it's like gibberish to you. You don't understand what they're talking about. Research for down those techniques. The second thing that would help you understand the techniques is start applying it at work. And this thing I'm telling you is how I was able to map out everything in my head. I had a mind map of all the techniques, all the knowledge areas, and how everything worked together. Just because when I started seeing those techniques and I knew that, okay, these things are strange to me. There's no way I'm going to know it in the exams because I found that in, when I was doing my practice test, I was always Feeling those questions with those techniques. I started using those techniques at work. You know, I started, you know, mapping processes, doing process diagrams, like mapping my own processes at work. Okay, when I come to work every day, what's my process? From when from when I turn on my computer, what's my process? I started mapping out my processes, you know, started drawing out process diagrams and all that. That just helped me to understand those things way better. So start applying any techniques on your on, your, uh, on the job right now, whatever you do. You don't have to be, even if you're not in a current, currently in a bureau, start applying those techniques to really help you. A question here, any idea how much watermark costs? Um, you can check their website. I don't know how much it costs is right now. And then they have group, they also have group discounts. So I know in the BA uh, WhatsApp group, some people were talking about you know, getting the group discount and sharing the cost to make it cheaper. So if you're interested in the watermark, I think you should reach out on the what's BA WhatsApp group and then ask for people. I think EK was one of the people and EK is on this call now. So you can reach out to EK and, you know, see how you guys can probably get the group discount. I think if you're more than five or something, you get a discount on all on their packages. So if there are no more questions, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope you found this beneficial. Um, I, I just thought to do this because there are quite a lot of people, a number of people who have shown interest in the CBAP uh, certification, people who have taken the action and taken steps to, you know, to submit their applications, book their dates, you know, pay for their exams. You know, you guys are one of the people who have decided to actually see this dream of yours come true. And trust me, I, I can, you can never be overemphasized that, you know, getting your CBAP certification makes you validate your knowledge and experience as a BA. It helps you with your job search. It helps you with negotiating a better salary. It helps you with being seen as someone who 
is a thought leader, you know, even your colleagues look up to you because they feel you have some level of expertise. So um, congrats to you guys in advance. And please don't hesitate to share your stories, your success stories. And if you have questions, ask, ask away in the uh, WhatsApp group. Chama is there, Shegu is there, and a couple of other uh, BAs, you know, who can help you with your journey. So on this note, thank you, Shegu, and thank you, Chama, and everybody that joined the webinar today. Uh, have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, bye.